In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with you. We'd like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. In the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's uh, turn to Mary and ask Mary to pray for us and to pray with us in our Perseverance family because Mary is one of the most prominent members in our Perseverance family. Let's pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now I'd like to invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many, many different titles. He's known as the Paraclete. He's also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. Holy Spirit is known also as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master. St. Paul reminds us with these words, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect as well as interior fire in our will. So we say the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Philip Neri, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, 
the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. The family that prays together stays together. So we start off our conversation every morning by praying together as a family, praying for each other. As a sweet sequel to this, I promise to pray for all of you, especially in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most important prayer that we can offer to Almighty God is that of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to pray for you in the Mass I'll be celebrating today at 12 as well as 6 o'clock. Double blessing. I'd like to place all of you on the altar. Begging God to shower you with special graces. Now, as always, I'd like to offer three specific intentions. And those will be the following. First of all, that in this Easter season, in which we're going to be entering into the Novena to the Holy Spirit, starting tomorrow, that you would experience great joy. A joy that comes not from created things, not from pleasure, not from eating or drinking, but rather a joy that comes from God himself. Mary teaches us this in her Magnificat when she says, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let's beg Mary to pray for us that we'll experience that joy that comes from our union with God. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My second intention, I'd like to pray for your children, especially on a day in which we'll be talking about a very joyful saint. That your children would recognize that they can experience joy. Not in the world. The world can offer us false joys. Only God can give us true joy. I pray that your children, children as well as teenagers, will be drawn to something that normally they're not drawn to. They'll be drawn to a life of prayer. Cannot find a, a saint that did not take prayer seriously. We'll see this in the life of St. Philip Neri, as, a, as well as in all the saints for that matter. That your children and teenagers will not be deceived by the devil, the flesh, and the world, thinking that their true happiness can be found in this world. It cannot be. Our Lady of Lourdes said to St. Bernadette, I cannot promise you happiness in this life. but in the life to come, in heaven, yes. So, my third intention, I'd like, you, I'd like to pray for world peace, starting with ourselves. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me, as the song goes. I'd like to also pray for that we be able to be a country that fosters life from the very beginning of conception until natural death. That, God willing, we will be able to overcome that Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, 
that the, we indeed will be people of life. Recognizing, my friends, that from the moment of conception until natural death, life is sacred. Life is sacred. So we'll be placing those intentions on the altar. Okay, given that we're in the, the month of May, the last week of the month of May, I'd like to give you a brief Marian catechesis. The brief Marian catechesis is the following. Yes, yesterday I celebrated my ordination to the priesthood, and also it was the same day in which the founder of the Oblates was our ordained a priest, Venerable Bruno Lanteri. He was actually ordained a priest when he was 23 years of age. He received a dispensation. And my Marian catechesis is the following. The saints were people who loved God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. But who helped the saints to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? It was the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's true. Mary helped the saints to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. So if you want to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then have this great love for Mary. After St. Dominic Savio died, he appeared to Don Bosco and was asking Don Bosco, what do you think gave me greatest joy? Don Bosco said, well, maybe your prayer life, well, guess again. Maybe your life of penance, guess again. Well, maybe your work with the young people, guess again. Dominic, I don't know, tell me. And Dominic said, my great love for Mary. So go spread devotion to Mary. So in the life of of my founder, the founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. He said that he was not the founder, but Mary was the foundress of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. He went on to say that part of our charism was to fight against current heresies. When he lived back in the 17, 1800s, one of the most prevalent and poisonous heresies that was spreading throughout Europe was that of Jansenism. Theological thought that promoted sadness, not to receive the sacraments often, few people would be saved. Kind of a glum, gloomy, depressing theology that contaminated many, many souls. So my father rejected that and tried to promote the teaching of St. Alfonso Liguori, who promoted God's love and mercy. But my founder was aware of this, that when heresies, when heresies would lift their ugly head in the world, it was through the Blessed Virgin Mary that the heresies would be conquered. So Mary would be the conqueror of all heresies. That's one of the highlights of the Mariology of Venerable Brunland Terry and the Oblates. That heresies will be conquered. But conquered through the powerful intercession of Mary. So my friends, let us turn to Mary and beg Mary for the grace to really love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay, today we're going to be celebrating, we'll be talking about a, a great saint. And not only when we talk about the saint, we think about the saint himself, but we think about 
our universal call to holiness, our universal call to holiness, that all of us, all of us are called to become great saints. Because Jesus says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. The saint that we'll celebrate today is St. Philip Neri. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church points out the following, that the saints can help us by their powerful prayers, their prayer of intercession. They're in heaven praying for us that we'll make it to heaven also because that's our eternal destiny is for us to get to heaven. But next, also the saints serve as models upon which we should be modeling our own lives. They practice heroic virtue and we're called also to practice heroic virtue, like the saints, like the saints. So say, today we celebrate St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri. Very good news. He was born July 21st, 1515, and died May 26th, 1995. He lived to be 80 years back, almost 500 years ago. So before I talk about the saint, I'd like to sh I show you something. It was, it was given to me a relic of St. Philip Neri. Can't see it too clearly, but uh, here we have a relic of St. Philip Neri. This is a first class relic of St. Philip Neri which means this is a bone. This is a little piece of the bone of this great saint that we're going to be talking about today. And at the end of our conversation, I will give you the blessing of the relic of St. Philip Neri. And I ask you to pray for us because starting the first Tuesday of June, for 10 weeks, we'll be going to the parish of St. Philip Neri in Linwood to be given the spiritual exercises to that parish where I had given the consecration to St. Joseph culminating on December 8th in which the church was packed. Pray that people will fill the church in honor of St. Philip Neri. So I'll give you a, a blessing from the relic of St. Philip Neri St. Philip Neri at the end of our conversation. So this saint was, <coughs> was born in 1515 and his name, the name they gave him was, uh, was Francisco, Francis, St. Francis, in honor of St. Francis. Even when he was very, very young, as a child, he showed just a lot of a lot of goodness, a lot of goodness, and especially a lot of joy. He's known as the joyful saint. He would carry two books with him: the New Testament, and he would take with him a joke book. So we take with him the New Testament as well as a joke book. And he was known for this phrase. I'll say it in Spanish. Spanish and English is almost the same. Then I'll translate it into English. He would say, Tristeza e melancholia fuera de casa mia. Translated, sadness and a melancholy spirit, get out of my house because he was aware that the devil tempts us often 
when we're sad. So let's pray to St. Philip Neri as we prayed earlier that we would be joyful. That we would be joyful Christians and Catholics. Pope Francis wrote a missionary encyclical at the beginning of his pontificate and the name of it is the joy of the gospel. Indeed, if we want to spread the joy of the gospel, the gospel message, it should be done with, with joy and that will attract people, attract people to Christ. So what happened was, as is often the case of the saints, his mother died when he was very young. So his father sent Philip to live with his uncle. Philip Mary was uh, from Florence, a Florentine, and he sent him to his uncle it turned out that his uncle had a lot of money. A lot of money. And his uncle planned to leave Philip uh, to inherit all this money. Philip later on would say this was, this would be his first conversion. Because instead of living with his uncle, where he'd be, he would abound in money and material possessions, Philip, even as a child, was aware of God's presence and the real danger, the real danger of, of materialism. Jesus said you can't serve God and money at the same time. The real danger of materialism. So he decided that he would travel north to Rome and little did he know that he would spend 55 years in Rome. And eventually he'd be called the second apostle to Rome. So he arrives and he's given a little room by one of his Florentine uh, Florentine friends that opened up his door to Philip. So he gave him just a, a small space underneath the staircase. And he would give Philip every day a little bit of bread, water, and a couple of olives. So Philip was very, we might call him very mortified. A Philip promised in turn to tutor his two boys. And almost immediately, the boys that were being tutored by Philip, their behavior improved. They became good students, and as well as those who, were, who would love God all the more. So, the first two years when Philip was in, in Rome, he dedicated himself especially to reading and praying and practicing penance and meditating. So in a certain sense, he was kind of preparing himself for the mission that God would give to him.
And, and eventually he's going to be studying both philosophy and theology on his own. But back then we're talking about the 1500s, the 16th century. Rome, the city of Rome, the eternal city, was in a terrible state. Priests were not well formed. The catechism was a disaster. So for basically another 40 years, St. Philip Neri would become known as the, 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 the principal catechist of Rome would be St. Philip Neri. And would she be teaching catechism? especially to the poor children, and he just had an ability to teach catechism. So let's pray that we ourselves would become good catechists. We live, many of us live in a big city like Los Angeles, in which the, the, the ignorance here is very vast, as it was in the time of Philip Neri. What was very attractive in the person of St. Philip Neri is that he was able to make friends of workers, of the sellers, and all, because of his joy. And he wanted basically the salvation of their souls. And one of the questions he'd always be making would be, when are we going to start to get better? When are we going to start to improve our lives? In other words, he was always challenging people to be converted. Now, not only did Philip Neri teach catechism, but back 500 years ago, the hospitals were deplorable. So he would go and he would visit the hospitals in Rome and help out the sick. And he would never separate these, these activities from a deep prayer life. So he would have been the Saint, he would have also been the Saint John Bosco of the time. He would round up young people and he'd basically have a day of picnic. He would go and visit seven of the most famous churches in Rome. Which you go into the churches and they'd pray and meditate. They would sing songs, they would play, they would have a picnic. So young people associated religion with happiness and joy. Just an incredible saint with so many gifts that he used for God. Now, a typical day of Philip would be he would get up and he would spend many hours teaching children catechism. Then he would go out and visit the hospitals and help out the sick people. Then he would bring young people to visit the churches to pray and meditate. But then at night, Philip Neri did not spend much time in prayer. I'm, I'm sorry, he did not spend much time sleeping, but he would spend many of the nights in prayer. He would sometimes go to the catacombs. You probably know the catacombs would be the, those underground tunnels where the early Christians had to hide so that they would not be martyred by the Romans. Spend long hours in prayer and meditate in the catacombs.
or spending time praying in front of the doors of the churches in Rome. Now, I'll tell you one of the first um, mystical phenomena that he experienced. And this is very appropriate for what we're going to be celebrating in about 10 days, Pentecost. He was preparing for Pentecost, praying in the catacomb, and he experienced it was like a, a ball of fire. A ball of fire <coughs> came down to the catacomb, and Philip had his mouth open, and the ball of fire entered into his mouth, went to his heart. And his heart beat so fast because of the love of God. That from that moment on, his heart would beat faster. Later on when he died, they noticed that two of his ribs were dislocated. His, his ribs were actually protruded because his heart beat so fast that it almost broke two of his ribs. Philip and Mary wanted to do more and more. And he's aware that conversion can only come about when people leave their sin and they get closer to God through prayer. So among the most fervent followers of Philip, he set up what is called, with the help of the priest, the 48 hours devotion. 40 hour, 48 hours devotion would be the blessed sacrament would be exposed for 40 hours and there would be adoration of the blessed sacrament constant for 40 hours which people would be alternating maybe every hour, every two hours, so that the Lord was accompanied for 40 hours. He also, during the Jubilee year, he received pilgrims in the year 1575, setting up a hostel for pilgrims and he was able to attend 145,000 pilgrims helping them obviously with helpers that year it's incredible the amount of good that Philip Neri did in his life and I think it should be a, a stimulus for us never to get tired of doing good he was sometimes asked as follows when are we going to start doing good after they had already done a lot of good, when are we going to start doing good? When are we going to start doing good, Philip Neri would say. So Philip Neri was getting older, getting into his 30s, and his spiritual director confessor thinking about his influence in Rome talked to Philip and said you know it would be better be better and more pleasing to God and you'd be able to do more work if um, you became a priest so up to he's into his 30s he's, he's, he's not working as a priest he's working at a lay people doing incredible good so even though Philip did not feel worthy, he was ordained a priest in the year 1551. 1551. So he's already in his 30s. Now, Philip Neri had other 
extraordinary gifts. But once he becomes a priest, it's going to change quite a bit. Another one of his charisms was he was he was a gifted confessor. He would spend long, long hours in the confessional. Long, long hours in the confessional. The church where he was in Rome, it's called in Italian La Chiesa Nuova. La Chiesa Nuova would be the new church. So he spent hours there. I'll tell you somewhat of a humorous anecdote when he was there in that church. By temperament, Philip Nero was very fastidious and very meticulous, very orderly, and he liked cleanliness. And he was always praying the Lord to become holy. He said, Lord, I help me to grow in patience. So what happened was in that church, there was a sacristan who was just the exact opposite. He was disorderly. So the sacristy in the church would be in dis disarray because of this sacristan. Philip Nair was praying to the Lord to give him patience. The sacristan made things worse and worse. And he, Philip Nair said, Lord, give me patience. And the Lord said, well, why do you think I gave you this sacristan? So that he could practice patience. So as confessor, he had the gift, like Padre Pio, he could actually read minds, read souls. And he could smell the, the terrible stench of sin, especially that against the virtue of purity, Philip Neri, like Catherine of Siena. And after confessing a lot of his penitents, he would take them to the churches in Rome to visit the churches, to go inside the churches, to pray, to meditate. Another gift of Philip. God is going to ask Philip to do many things. One was this, that Philip had this attraction he had this attraction in which he'd be bringing many people to Christ and they, they, they like to be around Philip. So what happened? These people came to be around him and what they would do was they'd come together and they would pray they would sing and they would read a passage from the life of a saint or maybe a biblical passage. And then what they would do would be to share. They would share the spiritual light or insight that was given to them. certain sense, kind of like what we do in the spiritual exercise of program, we have group sharing. Which is a, there's a facilitator and each one is called to share one of the lights, the insights, or the inspirations that God has given to them. So it started out by 
coming together kind of, on a certain sense, kind of like a charismatic, a charismatic meeting. Not that Philip intended this right away, because he was totally open to God. Talk about, we've been talking about the importance of being docile to God. The docility to the Holy Spirit is essential if we want to become saints. Philip Neri ends up by founding A new order. And the name of the order would be the Oratorian Fathers or the Followers of Philip, which they profess vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. This was approved by the Pope in the year 1575. when Philip was 60 years of age. The rule that he redacted was very simple. And the basis of the congregation was love for God and also love for souls. Wherever he went, wherever he went, Philip Neri would always be spreading great joy. Spreading great joy wherever he went. He would be bringing together many young people. So that they would be rejoicing. And he, he was keenly aware of the fact, my friends, that it's true, the spirit of sadness, the spirit of sadness is where the devil works to tempt people to fall into sin. He wanted his followers and young people to be joy, joyful. Years ago, I remember reading the life of Philip Neri, and another gift he had was the following. <laughs> Philip Neri, when people were dying on their deathbed, Philip Neri would go to be close to the dying people. And he was aware, Philip Nair was aware of the different temptations that the dying would experience. That's the moment when the devil attacks the last time. Some would be tempted not to pray. And Philip would pray. Others were tempted to give in despair. And Philip would spark them with trust and confidence in the Lord. Others were tempted where they'd be tongue-tied and they couldn't profess the creed. Philip would help them. Because St. Philip was keenly aware of the fact that the most important thing in the world is to get to heaven. To get to heaven. And the devil will often launch his last attack on the soul who's about to pass from this world to the next. To, get, to, to move that soul into giving into despair. So that was another charismatic gift of Philip. 
helping souls to die in the state of grace. Nothing more important than that. I'd like to tell you another story or two in the life of Philip Mary, just an, an incredible gifted saint. This story can help us to appreciate more and more the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Philip would celebrate the Mass, his Mass in, um, in Rome, in the church of uh, La Chiesa Nuova, the new church. And he noticed something that at the end of the Mass, there was one man who constantly, at the very end of the Mass, he would get up and he would rush out into the street without spending any time In Thanksgiving, <clears throat> almost as if his pants were on fire. He would take off for the door even before the final blessing. And this was very obvious that people saw this man rushing out of the church. Consequently, Philip Neri, watching this man, for several times, he decided that the following day he would try to remedy this problem. So, he told two of the altar servers, two of the altar servers to do something special the following day at the end of Mass. If this man showed up. So sure enough, this man showed up. And at the end of Mass, before the Mass was over, this man, he rushed outside into the street before the final blessing. And this time, to the altar servers carrying a lighted candle, one on the left of the man, another one on the right of the man, followed closely behind the man. And Philip Neri also followed behind the man with his hands folded. The man turned around, literally shocked at seeing these altar servers, one on his right, another one on his left, and Father Philip walking behind him with his hands folded. And the man asked St. Philip Neri, well, what are you doing? And St. Philip said, well, given that you're rushing out of the church with the Eucharist within your heart, you are a Corpus Christi. We thought that we would make a Eucharistic procession through the streets of Rome and you would be the Corpus Christi. And we thought that we'd have an altar server on your right and an altar server on your left. The man shamefacedly returned to church. From that moment on, he would spend some time after Mass in Thanksgiving. 
So my friends, it's a, it, there's just so many stories in the life of this great saint. But how, how, are we, how will we interpret that for us? Now, if you go to daily Mass, you're not obliged to go to daily Mass. You're not obliged to go to daily Mass. But if you can spend some time after the final blessing in Thanksgiving, that is something that would be very, very pleasing to God. My friends, the most important minutes in our lives are those minutes when we have the Eucharistic Lord Jesus within our hearts. If we do not have family obligations or work obligations, spending some time spending some time in silent adoration and thanksgiving after Mass are among the most precious moments in our lives. It happened that Philip Neri would sometimes, when he celebrated Mass, He'd lift up the host and entered into ecstasy for sometimes hours, like Padre Pio. Like Padre Pio. He was so absorbed in what was going on in Holy Mass that he lifted up the host, that he entered into this state of trance or ecstasy for a couple hours, he had the Blessed Sacrament there. A couple hours. And how we should pray to this great saint. How we should pray to this great saint that we would have a greater Eucharistic devotion. Among the other many great gifts that Philip Neri had was that many people came to him for a spiritual direction. The end of his life, he could barely leave his room and people would be coming in to visit him day and night, seeking his blessing and seeking his spiritual direction. Charles Borromeo sought his spiritual direction. Even Saint Ignatius of Loyola sought his spiritual direction. Saint Camillus de Lelis, some of the greatest saints would seek out his spiritual direction because they knew that this man was a great saint, St. Philip Neri. So at the end of his life, May 25th, 1595, the doctor saw him very joyful. He said, I rejoice when they heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. One of those Psalms. I rejoice when I heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. So at midnight he had attack. And the last gesture he did was he, ra he raised his hand to bless the priests that were surrounding him. Then he gave up his spirit. Philip Neri was 80 years old. He was declared a saint in the year 1622.
And the people of Rome considered him to be one of the greatest catechists and spiritual directors that Rome ever had. His canonization was very interesting. You know, when someone is canonized, they have you have what is called the devil's advocate to try to put reasons why he shouldn't become a saint. Now, what they leveled against Philip was the following. They said, well, he probably shouldn't become a saint because in Rome, with the young people, he used some vulgar language. He'd use the street language of the of the Romans, an Italian called Romanaccio. So they were leveling this against him, saying, "Yeah, probably best not to canonize him because he his language was somewhat ribald, somewhat vulgar." While they're discussing this, according to tradition, while they're discussing this, Philip Neri appeared to them. Don't forget he's already dead. St. Philip Neri appeared to them and his typical sense of humor, they saw him do this. <laughs> so he had the last joke. And then they said, Hey, let's canonize this man. Tristezza e melancholia fuera di casa mia. Sadness and a melancholy spirit get out of my house. So, my friends, as I promised all of you, I have the privilege of having the first class relic of St. Philip Neri, which I'm kissing right now. I, my friends, feel privileged to have a little piece of the bone of St. Philip Neri. I would like to bless all of you in a very, very special way with the relic of St. Philip Neri. What a great, 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 great privilege this is. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Saint Philip Neri, the joyful saint and apostle of Rome, pray for us. Amen.